Hi friends, Tony DeWitt here, Missouri Appellate Attorney and a guy who likes to make the law make sense on YouTube. Here's what we're discussing today. It's kind of funny sometimes when you sit down to do something like a video on jury instructions and you go all the way through a 25 minute video without realizing that at the very beginning of that video you neglected to tell people something that was pretty important. So, since I've already missed the boat on the first of these, let me start part two with this advisory. And that is that jury instructions are not static, and they are not uh, something that the, the court just picks and chooses out of a book. They are instead submitted by both sides. Now, a lot of the instructions we went over yesterday from the Michigan instructions are the routine instructions that are given in every trial. And they're given for a reason, and that is to make sure that the defendant gets a fair trial. But there are other instructions that are requested and sometimes denied that also contribute to a fair trial. But in many cases, even if they are not given, it's not considered to be an error. It's really a, a difficult thing in the law to figure out when you might have a viable appeal for a failure to instruct. Now, in Missouri, they've made the law fairly clear that if the evidence supported an instruction on a particular defense and the court did not give it, then the, the case has to go back. It has to be undone and, and redone. So that's really important, and I should have mentioned that. Normally what happens is before trial, the judge will talk to both sets of lawyers and say, okay, look, I need a set of jury instructions from both of you. Now, he's probably got all of those ones that we looked at yesterday. He's probably got his own set that he uses in every criminal case. And he's probably marked them up. He's probably added a few things. He may have added examples. He may have uh, changed things with regard to current events to, to cover things that, that everybody in that locality might know. As long as the substance of the instruction is accurate and as long as he doesn't deviate too far from the approved instructions, he's not going to be in trouble for adding things to the instructions. But for the most part, judges stick right with the instructions, and particularly in the important or high-profile or well-publicized cases, that's what they do. And the reason they do that is because they don't want to be reversed. They don't want to have to go through this again. Now, the defense, on the other hand, they're more than happy to go through it again if somebody makes an error, and so... They do try to point out all of the possible errors during the course of the trial in order to preserve them, because if you don't tell the judge, judge, you have an obligation to give that instruction, and he does, and he fails to give the instruction, well, if you didn't ask for it and you didn't object and, and make a record for why that instruction should be given, you're probably not going to win. So defense lawyers do that, but they also accept that it's the judge who actually gets the final call on whether or not you give an instruction. But some of the instructions that we'll talk about today are instructions that, in many, <clears throat> in many respects, are made by request of either the defendant or the state, and they reflect the current state of the law in that jurisdiction. So I wanted to show you what, you know, one of the things that, that you want to avoid, of course, if you're handing out written instructions to the jury and, of course, they do hand out written instructions to the jury at the close of the evidence. One of the things you want to avoid is having something that says, this is a defendant's instruction A, or you don't want to have something that says prosecutor's instruction number four. What you want is you want to have an instruction, right, instruction number. So here's what happens. First, the defendant submits a proposed instruction. This is defendant's proposed instruction nine, citation copy, so that the judge knows that it came from uh, Journal 1, 18.1 of, of the Michigan Criminal Instructions. And it's on armed robbery. And it tells you what the defense believes the jury should hear with respect to the charges and the evidence. And then the next thing that happens is that goes to the court. And of course, the state also submits an instruction. These are called verdict directors. The state also submits a verdict director, and it may wind up being very close to or the same, and one side or the other may say, ah, let's use his. 
because in many respects they're not going to differ because the the pattern jury instructions are designed to be given in the way that they are so that there's not a lot of wiggle room. The only thing that might be necessary is, for example, where it, it says here, a larceny is the taking and movement of someone else's property or money with the intent to take it away from that person permanently. If you had somebody who walked into a, uh, let's say, a quickie mart with a pistol and grabbed a, a couple of beer, a couple of cans of beer and started to walk out uh, and realized, of course, after he got out that he had these cans of beer and hadn't paid for them and walked back in and happened to be seen having a pistol, you would want him to be able to argue that he had to be, it had to be clear that he was taking it away permanently. So it's a terrible example, but basically anytime there is a question about the way a word is used in an instruction, you can have additional instruction on that. And of course, that's essentially what this does. In the course of committing a larceny includes acts that occur in an attempt to commit the larceny, during the commission of a larceny, or in flight or attempted flight after. So all of these things are, these are the things that, that the jury relies on to determine guilt or innocence. So after the state and the defense object and make a record and decide whether or not this instruction needs to be renumbered or needs to be revised in some way, what you then have is that instruction being labeled instruction blank and the judge will write in whatever number it winds up being. Because all of these instructions that are given in, from, from the book of instructions, all of these instructions that are given are going to have a sequential number. This is instruction number one, where we tell you about what a trial is. So by the time you get down here, you're at instruction eight, nine, 15, whatever it is, that number goes there, and there is nothing in the, at the base of the instruction or anywhere else that tells the jury that this came from a book or that it's based on a certain case. And the reason that isn't done is because sometimes deliberations go overnight. People go home, and they, sadly enough, even though they're told not to, they look up the case. And that, that just is not what we want them to do. So this is why instructions are handled this way. Both sides get an opportunity to ask for and get instructions. And only if there is evidence supporting the instruction is the judge supposed to give the instruction, and many times it's discretionary. The judge doesn't have to give the instruction. When it is discretionary, the, the statute or the rule book will say something to the effect of the court may instead of the court shall. So now we're going to talk about the other instructions that can be given and why you might give them. This is not going to be a comprehensive list of all of these instructions. It's just going to be um, a little bit of information about why some of these things have come about, why the instructions are given, and, and that sort of thing. Now, this is from the Michigan Pattern Jury uh, Instructions, and you can see that they have these broken down into chapters. Chapter 3 was verdict forms, and that's basically amounts to a, a page of, of instructions that say, these are the verdicts you can return, guilty, not guilty, not guilty by reason of insanity. Whatever verdict the court could allow them to reach will be written down on that verdict form. There's not a lot of great um, teaching material in that, in that chapter. But this is the chapter on evidence, and this is the place where if there is going to be a screw-up in the courtroom, this is where you are going to have that screw-up. And here are some of these instructions with respect to evidence that a court might give during trial. And of course, if something happens at trial and something gets ad admitted or said that wasn't anticipated, it sort of hits everybody out of the blue. Uh, for example, many of you who may have watched the Kyle Rittenhouse claim uh, case may realize that, that uh, Mr. Binger blundered when he started talking about the episode that the court had already made a decision to exclude. And so the court had to make an instruction and write out an instruction and give an instruction with respect to when that happened. So this, these are, are normally given because you know what's going to happen in the case. You know what the state's going to offer as evidence, and the state knows what the defendant's going to offer as evidence. And for the most part, they know what the witnesses are going to say. But 
to the extent that they do not, these are the, the things that can be done and should be done. So, let's go first of all to this one. Defendant's statements as evidence against the defendant. Now, one of the things that they will do is they will say, the prosecution has introduced evidence of a statement that it claims the defendant made. Now, notice they're not calling it a confession. Although a statement is preferable to confession or admission, it is the latter descriptions that have been used throughout the trial, then they should be used in the instructions. But for the most part, a judge will usually instruct the parties to refer to it as a statement because calling it an admission or calling it a confession may not necessarily be accurate. Unless, of course, in the course of making the confession, the guy says, yeah, I mean, this is my confession. I've got to tell you what I did. In that situation, it'd be pretty ridiculous to instruct the jury to tell them that it's not an, a confession or an admission. But what it says is the prosecution has said that they've made the statement. Before you may consider such court, out-of-court statement against the defendant, you must first find that he actually made the statement, and then you have to give it whatever weight you think it deserves. So we're not putting a great deal of emphasis on this statement. We're just saying, hey, you know, if you find this to be something the defendant said, then by all means, take the time to give it the weight that you believe it needs to be given. This is something else that a lot of people don't understand. You've got two people. Both of them went into the Quickie Mart. One of them had a pistol. One of them had a shotgun. And the guy with the shotgun says, yeah, you know, we did it. We went in there, we kicked down the door, we told Mr. Jones he better cough up the cash register. And he, get, he has this confession, so, I mean, he's going away for a while anyway. That confession, the confession that he made, can't be brought into court and used against the co-defendant. So, defendant Jones's statement has been admitted as evidence only against him. It cannot be used against defendant Smith. You must not do so. I mean, that's, that's pretty clear. And the reason you don't want to have that done, even if they were partners in crime, is because every case has to be judged only on the evidence that's applicable to that defendant. Circumstantial evidence. Now, this, I think, is an absolutely great instruction. I wish more courts used it. It says, facts can be proved by direct evidence from a witness or an exhibit. A direct evidence is evidence about what we actually see or hear. For example, if you look outside and you see rain falling, that is direct evidence of it raining. Now, that doesn't seem too particularly, you know, profound until you get to the rest of this. Facts can be proved by indirect or circumstantial evidence. Circumstantial evidence is evidence that normally or reasonably leads to other facts. So, if you see a person come in from outside wearing a raincoat covered with small drops of water, that would be circumstantial evidence that it's raining. You may consider circumstantial evidence. Circumstantial evidence by itself or a combination of circumstantial and direct evidence can be used to prove the elements of a crime. In other words, you should consider all the evidence that you believe. So that's an important qualifier. We talked about this uh, with regard to Donald Edelson. Uh, Michigan's instruction says there's been some evidence that the defendant, Donald Edelson, tried to run away or tried to hide after the alleged crime that she was accused of committing, police and after police tried to arrest her. The evidence does not prove guilt. A person may run or hide for innocent reasons such as panic, mistake, or fear. However, a person may also run because of consciousness of guilt. You must decide whether the evidence is true, and if true, whether it shows the defendant had a guilty state of mind. Great instruction, and one that, that really makes a lot of sense. Prior inconsistent statement used to impeach witnesses. This is something that every trial advocacy class in law school talks about, impeaching with prior inconsistent statements. Normally, somebody will say, you know, in a, in a, for example, in a civil case, well, you know, when you, take their, when you take their statement at the side of the roadway, they say the light was green, and then later on when they get into their deposition, they say, well, you know, the light was actually yellow, and then when they get to trial, they're like, no, that thing was red as a beet, you know. Then have the opportunity to impeach them with their prior inconsistent statements, statements that are inconsistent with the ones they're making now. You have heard evidence that before a trial, the witnesses made a statement that may be inconsistent with their testimony here in court. You can consider an inconsistent statement made before the trial to help you decide whether how, to be, how believable the witness's testimony was 
when testifying here in court. If the earlier statement was made under oath, then you may also consider the earlier statement as evidence of the truth of whatever the witnesses said in the earlier statement when determining the facts of this case. So, again, fairly interesting in terms of how they use the prior inconsistent statement. Judicial notice, I won't go into that. Stipulation. A lot of times, lawyers will stipulate to facts. When lawyers do that, you may regard such stipulated facts as true, but you are not required to do so. Important. Motive. Everybody knows that you don't have to prove motive when you prove a homicide, but you may consider whether the defendant had a reason to commit the alleged crime, but a reason by itself is not enough to find a person guilty of a crime. The prosecutor does not have to prove that the defendant had a reason to commit the alleged crime. He only has to show the defendant actually committed the crime and that he or she meant to do so. And of course, they can add that last part if the defense requests it, and if the evidence supports it. Now, this is something that um, I think was relevant in the Murdaugh trial, right? Evidence of other offenses, relevance limited to a particular issue. You have heard evidence that was introduced to show the defendant uh, committed, in his case, financial crimes for which he is not on trial. If you believe this evidence, you must be very careful only to consider it for certain purposes. You may only think about whether this evidence tends to show that the defendant had a reason to commit the crime or that the defendant specifically meant to cheat people, that the defendant knew that the things found in his or her possession were somehow criminal. All of these things, these are all added only, in other words, you don't add all of these, you add only the ones that make sense. So in this case, that the defendant had a reason, or in Murdoch's case, I should say, that the defendant had a reason to commit the crime, to cover up his financial indiscretions. So, you must not consider this evidence for any other purpose. For example, you must not decide that it shows the defendant is a bad person, or that he's likely to commit crimes. You must not convict the defendant here because you think he or she is guilty of other bad conduct. All evidence must be convince you beyond a reasonable doubt that the defendant committed the alleged crime, or you must not. Or you must find him not guilty. Okay, no matter what you do, I don't want you to think about an elephant, a pink elephant, wearing blue clothing. How'd that work out for you? Did you immediately think of a pink elephant wearing blue clothing? Most people do. Because when someone tells you not to do something, there's some switch somewhere in most of our brains that goes, uh-uh, you're not going to tell me what to think. And when you tell jurors not to think that this could be used for other purposes, like indicating that someone is a bad person, well, folks, it just doesn't work. And all it really does is it draws more attention to the fact that you are using evidence of other crimes essentially for the bad person reference. Now, you're not supposed to be. And in his case, it was designed to show a motive or a reason for why he acted. And that actually is a legitimate reason to use that evidence. But it's this instruction at the end about no matter what else, you, you absolutely can't use it for any other purpose that I think most jurors tend to completely ignore. Fingerprint evidence. The prosecutor has introduced evidence about fingerprints. You may consider this evidence when you decide whether the prosecutor has proved beyond a reasonable doubt the defendant was the person who committed the alleged crime. However, fingerprints matching the defendant's must have been found in the place the crime was committed under such circumstances that they could have been put there when the crime was committed. Almost all crimes call for some kind of intent. The defendant's intent may be proved by what he said or she said, what he or she said or did, what, how she did it, or by any other facts and circumstances in evidence. In other words, you can look at the totality of the evidence here. You can look at all of these things, and you can apply your common sense to determine whether or not they had intent. Uh, a good way to look at that is whether, for example, in, in uh, Alec Baldwin's case, did he have the intent to act recklessly? Well, you can certainly determine his intent to act restless, recklessly by the fact that he, that he didn't follow the, fa the far, four rules of gun safety, that he didn't you know, make sure to point the gun in a safe direction, and that he had not taken a great deal of instruction on that particular pistol. All of those things, the totality of all of that evidence is something 
that you can use to determine whether or not he had the intent necessary. Now we get into witnesses, and there are only a few of these that I want to go over, but many of these are really important. So, impeachment by prior conviction. You may have heard that one witness, Mr. Smith, has been convicted of a crime in the past. You should judge this witness's testimony the same way that you judge the testimony of any other witness. You may consider his past criminal convictions along with all the other evidence when you decide whether to believe his testimony and how important you think it is. So, if somebody does have a prior conviction, then you can judge it for whatever worth it may have. Now, if the witness is somebody who happened to be passing on the street and saw an armed robbery, and he has a conviction five years ago for DUI, well, I mean, that doesn't make him out to be a liar when he says the guy in the ski mask is the guy who's sitting there at the defense table. That's the kind of thing that you want to be careful about when you try and impeach somebody with a prior conviction particularly if you're the prosecutor, you get up and you impeach them with a conviction that has absolutely no relevance to the crime that you're discussing in the case. It just makes you look mean-spirited and ugly. Weighing conflicting evidence, number of witnesses, you shouldn't decide the case on the basis of which side presented more witnesses. That only makes more sense. Witness who has been interviewed by a lawyer. You've heard that a lawyer or a lawyer's representative talked to one of the witnesses. There's nothing wrong with this. A lawyer may talk to a witness to find out what the witness knows about the case and what the witness's testimony will be. Here is an instruction about uh, accomplice testimony. You should examine an accomplice's testimony closely and be careful about accepting it. You may think about whether the accomplice's testimony is supported by other evidence because then it may be more reliable. However, there's nothing wrong with the prosecutor using an accomplice as a witness. You may convict the defendant based only on an accomplice's testimony if you believe the testimony, and it proves the defendant's guilt beyond a reasonable doubt. When you decide whether to believe an accomplice, you may consider the following. Was the accomplice's testimony falsely slanted to make the defendant seem guilty because of the accomplice's own interests or biases or for some other reason? Has the accomplice been offered a reward or promised anything that might lead him or her to give false testimony? And C, has the accomplice been promised that he or she will not be prosecuted? So in general, you should consider an accomplice's testimony more cautiously than you would that of any other ordinary witness. Now, one thing I want to um, talk about real quickly here is what happens in the real world when you have an accomplice someone like Katie Maggs in the Adelson case. And when they, you know, the, the guy gets up and says, you know, you, you are doing this to get out of prison. No, I, I wasn't promised anything. Well, prosecutors aren't idiots. They're not going to say, okay, you, you know, you help us lock the key away on old Charlie here, and we're going to get you a get out of jail free card. They don't do that. What they do is they say, if things go as we believe they will go, and you testify truthfully, then we will take a look at re-examining your involvement in the case. And that's as far as they're going to go. Now, later on, they might wind up getting life without parole, switched to life with parole, because of the you know, significance of the testimony that's offered. But again, an instruction like this doesn't help if the prosecutor finds weasel words to get around the true intent of the instruction, which is to tell jurors, hey, a lot of times people will tell a story just to save their own behind. So let's end up here today with this particular, uh, with this particular instruction, character evidence regarding credibility of witnesses. You've heard evidence about the character of Mr. Smith for truthfulness. You may consider this evidence together with all the other evidence in the case in deciding whether to believe the testimony of Mr. Smith and deciding how much weight to give that testimony. The prosecutor has cross-examined some of the defendant's character witnesses as to whether they had any heard anything bad about the defendant. You should consider such cross-examination only in deciding whether you believe the character witnesses and whether they described the defendant fairly. The prosecutor also called witnesses who testified the defendant does not have good character for truthfulness. This evidence can only be considered by you in judging the believability of defendant's testimony. It is not evidence that he or she committed the the crime charge. 
So again, they only use the portions of this that are applicable in a particular case. So all of these instructions can be given during the course of trial. And a lot of times a defendant, for example, will hold back impeaching evidence uh, with regard to a, a police witness or a witness to the crime. They'll hold that back and then bam, slap it on them in trial and it catches the, the prosecutor by surprise. And when that happens, what you wind up with is a jury instruction like that one. And of course, then the cross-examination comes in and all of that. These are The entirety of these instructions are designed to help the jury reach a fair verdict. And that's the really important part of jury instructions and why they have to be followed. Now, you know, in baseball, they say the tie goes to the runner, and in the criminal law, the tie sort of goes to the defendant. And that's because you only want to put people away who you can show definitely committed the crime, beyond a reasonable doubt. And so if the evidence is not in, in full support of a guilty conviction, you want to make sure that jurors use the right instructions to reach the right verdict. Well, that's what I have for you today. Thank you so much for watching. I know this is a somewhat of a dry subject, but it was interesting to somebody, so I wanted to get it out there. Jury instructions are important, and I uh, believe this is probably all I need to do, but if you guys send me questions by email, right up there, if you send me questions by email, I will try to put together the answers to those questions in a video at a later date. Thank you again for watching. If you have the opportunity today, do something nice for folks. Doesn't have to be a big thing. Open a door. You know, pick up something that somebody drops. It is a wonderful way to help your fellow man. And if we help our fellow man, we make the world a better place one person at a time. Please, follow me down here tomorrow at the beach. If you like this video, here are a few others you might try, and don't forget to subscribe. Have a terrific day, guys.